19 genotyping is here and available today. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so um, my name is Gwen McMillan. I um, am with the University of Utah Department of Pathology and also a medical director um, of pharmacogenomics and drug testing at ARUP Laboratories. ARUP is a national reference laboratory, so a slightly different perspective than that provided by Dr. Wu. So in my 10 minutes or so, I'm um, going to cover some of the more practical aspects related to implementation of this type of testing. Clearly, the presentations from Dr. Wu and Dr. Cole, as well as others here at AACC, have demonstrated that there is value in knowing this type of information when personalizing care for patients that are candidates for clopidogrel. So uh, what I'll be doing then is talk a little bit about uptake of this kind of testing. So with this black box um, warning that's come out, how has that affected demand for testing? And then um, provide a little bit of insight into considerations uh, relative to the laboratory operations and reporting, and follow up with some additional things that you might do with this type of testing um, should you choose to bring it online. So in terms of demand for CYP2C19, um, I think this slide speaks for itself, showing the proportional increase in demand um, that we have observed over the last year. So what this shows basically in a proportional way is that our, our demand for CYP2C19 volumes has gone up um, about 40-fold between uh, first quarter and fourth quarter of this last fiscal year. And you'll see that the beginning of that increase occurred in March, um, right in line with the release of the black box warning. As a reference laboratory, I really don't have clinical information about these patients, um, but looking at the demographics, I would say that um, most of these patients probably are candidates for Plavix that are being evaluated. Uh, the average age of our patients is 70 years of age, and uh, the median was 72, and we're dealing with approximate good distribution of, of males and females. Um, I also think it's interesting to know that these sample requests came from 37 different states over this last quarter, indicating it's not a local phenomenon or some artifact of a, a clinical study, perhaps, but that this is something that's, that's diversely interesting around the country. In terms of laboratory considerations, one of the first things is what kind of specimen. Um, this is a genetic test, and so any source of DNA will do. Um, some choose to use saliva or buccal swabs for collection convenience. We do use blood at AREP. In terms of uh, the next steps, there are a number of guidelines relative to genetic testing for laboratories that are extremely valuable references. Um, so I would recommend consulting the guidelines and standards published through the College of American Pathologists, New York Department of Health, American College of Medical Genetics, and um, potentially others. The NACB, National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry, also just came out with some guidelines. One of the things we need to think about in the laboratory is quality control, and uh, so it's important to assure that you always have a no-template control as well as a positive control, and in, in our case, many times positive controls are simply heterozygote patient samples that have been archived and pooled. Um, and uh, to cover all the variants, we may actually rotate through different variants with different uh, runs. But there are commercially available controls available as well. Also want to mention that there is a proficiency testing survey offered through the College of American Pathologists that covers CYP2C19 genotyping. So one question I get a lot is, well, what do you put on your report? And uh, so consulting those guidelines, you can generate quite a list of things that might be important. Um, obviously, the collection information, what type of specimen, details about the patient, as well as the results, so the genotype itself. 
One thing unique about genetic testing is, for the most part, it requires oversight or some sort of review of the results um, by a qualified professional. And then it's recommended to include a lot of information about the analytical method. Um, reimbursement is based on method associated CPT codes, so it's very important to understand what the appropriate CPT codes are for billing. Um, it's also important when comparing results between laboratories to assure that the content is the same when you're comparing two different results. Um, these tests are designed to detect very specific single nucleotide polymorphisms, and uh, so all tests are not created equally, and it's important to understand actually what you're getting for the test. Um, so listing all the variants detected, as well as limitations of testing, including whether or not an analyte-specific reagent is used. Further, you'll want to include clinical information, um, in particular interpretation. What we find is that many of the people, cardiologists, ordering these tests are not geneticists per se, and they, they need guidance on what to do with these results, what the results actually mean. So it's important to provide that as well as suggestions for any additional or alternate testing, such as Dr. Wu suggested. There are functional tests. There um, potentially are phenotyping tests relative to therapeutic drug monitoring that will become available. So th they may be appropriate depending on the specific patient scenario. References and access to consultation, either a genetic counselor or a, a director from the laboratory that can um, answer questions and uh, consult on the appropriate next steps. So I, I like this uh, statement, a note out of the CAP checklist, the Molecular Pathology Checklist, which emphasizes that laboratory reports should be designed to convey patient results effectively to a non-expert physician. So really this, these are not geneticists that are ordering the tests, and um, so we need to get ensure that the language is appropriate for anybody to understand. In terms of interpretation, um, I'm just going to reiterate the points made by our previous speakers. This is one algorithm that we've used. Um, so that while we don't know specifically what the best dose is for individual patients, we do have some rough guidelines to follow, such that if a patient has no poor metabolizer variants, um, then or CYP2C17 only, then we're, we are going to expect that active drug will be produced, but it doesn't mean that the patient's going to respond. Pharmacodynamics are not necessarily related to pharmacokinetics. So it's important to monitor response. It's also important to consider drug-drug interactions, because even though you may genotypically be wild type, if the patient is taking fluvoxamine or chloramphenicol or an anticonvulsant or something that inhibits CYP2C19, you're going to produce a poor metabolizer phenotype. So understanding drug-drug interactions and looking for them is, is also very critical in managing patients. So this is, this is one extreme where everything appears normal. The other is where we have two poor metabolizer variants that have been identified. Um, clearly, uh, the patient is not going to be expected to produce the active metabolite, and so an alternate drug is going to be recommended. Um, and then, of course, monitor response. When we have a heterozygote scenario with one poor metabolizer variant, then um, it becomes much more iffy in terms of exactly what to do, whether to provide a higher dose, do some dose escalation, follow up with therapeutic drug monitoring or pharmacodynamic testing, functional testing, or whether to go with an alternate drug. And, uh, so I think we'll gain a lot more experience when this testing becomes more widely utilized. So we bring this test on, and let's say Prazogrel does take off, and so you don't have, uh, oh, sorry, we're going to talk about turnaround time first. This is another question that comes up quite often, is what's an appropriate turnaround time for this test? Clearly, turnaround time is always a balance between clinical need and laboratory cost efficiency, and uh, in my experience, a turnaround time of about one week is completely appropriate for this type of testing. Okay, so here are the other uses for CYP2C19 testing. As Dr. Cole said, there are a lot of substrates known for CYP2C19, so that cover a wide variety of medical indications, and um, so potentially this type of testing has uh, could benefit in 
selecting the right dose for individual patients. The first thing we need to know is, is what the role of 2C19 is in metabolism of any one of these substrates. And then also to be sure we understand what the content of our 2C19 testing is. So are we only looking at star 2, star 3? Are we looking at star 17? Are we looking at a huge um, range of variants? Because that will be important in interpreting what goes on. So the possible scenarios are that CYP2C19 is the major drug pathway for either activation or inactivation of the drug. And an example of that is clopidogrel. So CYP2C19 is the major pathway for activation of Clavix. And we know that when we have impairment, it will interfere with the activation of that drug. So that's clinically significant. In the scenario where CYP2C19 is a minor pathway, um, it might be extremely important to know if a star 17 is involved because by ramping up the metabolism through this ultra-rapid metabolizer variant, we may convert CYP2C19 from a minor pathway to a major pathway. And there's been some evidence, um, in particular with tamoxifen, showing that women who carry this variant uh, respond better to tamoxifen because uh, of the uh, production of an active metabolite uh, known as endoxifen. So lots of potential applications. What you need to know is the drug gene interactions as well as drug drug interactions. And that's all I've got.